the season's finally here and there's maiden podiums and even an F1 driver appearance. Welcome to the fifth episode of Formula Talk, where we're here to discuss an F2 and F3 Bahrain review. Joining me is the wonderful Tom. Hello. Hello. I don't know about wonderful, but thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> how are you? I'm all right. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Can't complain. But yeah, um, but first, if you enjoy this podcast, we would love it if you would take five to leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're one of the 72% of people who haven't yet subscribed to this channel, please consider helping us out with a like, subscribe, share, or follow. Now let's get into it. The season's finally started, and it was no shortage of action-packed racing this entire weekend between main and wins, all rookie uh, lineups, time penalties, safety cars, and even an F1 driver ex- appearance. Let's kick it off with qualifying, and let's start with Formula 3 first. Taking the first point of the Formula 3 2023 season was Gabriel Mini. Uh, rookie driver Gabriel Mini in his F3 career began it with a knockout fashion, storming his way to his first pole position, taking the first points of the F3 2023 season on his championship debut in Secure. The high-tech Pulse driver's late effort of a 147.055 could not be matched as less than half a second separated the top 17 drivers out of the full grid of 30. Wow. <laughs> That shows how close the racing will definitely be this season, right, Tom? Oh God, yes. I mean, you know, half a second between between the top seventeen drivers. I mean, yes, you know, it's a spec series to a point, but that you know, surely that just means that we're in for some absolute banger races this year, and that is absolutely what we had in in this first round. So yeah, I'm a yeah, I'm gonna bring on the rest of the season. Yeah, definitely. Looking at the times, actually, the top 20 all clocked a 147 of some sort as well. So that's absolutely crazy. And I think th- even the last time, um, <clears throat> there was one that was not classified due to um, not having a lap time in. But most of them were within a, a second and a half, just under two seconds from P1 to P29 for it. Um but yeah, so as mentioned in our previous episodes, make sure you take a listen. In Formula 3, the top 12 are actually reverse grid for the sprint. So taking the pole position for the sprint race that took place on the Saturday was actually Franco Colapinto with a 147.398. Joining him was Joseph Pepe Marti with a 147.391. Now, we mentioned Gabriel Mini winning, uh, taking the top pole position. Alongside him is another rookie driver of Gabriel Bortolato for Triton, which was a 147-112. So very, very, very close to each other. And then we mentioned before this name, and he's rumored to be probably one of the favorites for the season, Gregor Asalsi also um, finished off third in the qualifying. Now, Let's see how qualifying was for Formula 2. It's a bit different, as mentioned as well. In Formula 2, it's the top 10 that's reversed uh, for the sprint race. However, it was Teo Porcher started off the season great. We said that he was definitely one to look out for, and he's definitely proven that straight away, taking the pole position. He was actually 0.7 seconds ahead of anybody else. He was in a class of his own. Oh, my God. What was your thoughts? Uh, well, I mean, given you know, sort of how much we were hyping up F two last time, and rightly so, and also given how close F three was, to see Porsche go, you know, seven tenths quicker than than, than P two, I was like, okay, yeah, this guy's got something to prove. And you know, last season things didn't quite work out for him. You know, perhaps a bit of inexperience came into things, but he's had a year in F two. He's got his feet under the table or into the cockpit, as if you like. And um, and yeah, he's uh, he's looking really, really quick this year, and especially his performances in the sprint and feature races, which we'll get on to later on. You know, but just that, just that sort of that quality performance alone, that's really laying down a marker for the rest of the field. He's really sort of set the tone. He's like, look, lads and lasses, if you want, you know, if you want to take this championship from me, you're gonna have to come and fight for it. And he's he's really put a stake in the ground. 
Definitely. I mean, his first attempt put him in P1 and then he was like, you know what? I can do it better and just kept on like treading down the times. Like I said, it was probably one of the master classes in qualifying. And even he, I feel like, was quite shocked to see how well the performance is. But joining him is actually his teammate, Victor Martens, F3 2022 world champion as well. His time was a 141.654. Um, as mentioned, Teo Porche was six seconds, seven seconds ahead, uh, which was a 140.903. So ART started off the season with a great start, having a front row lockout for the feature race. Now for the sprint in F2, as mentioned, it's reverse of the top 10. So it was Campos Racing's oldest driver, longest driver, I should say, actually, in Formula 2, uh, Ralph Borchon, who f- had a time of a 142.010. And joining him is Roman Stanek from Trident with a 141.988. So they started off the sprint race, which is the shorter distance on the Saturday, at the front row. So starting off with Formula 3 sprint race, as mentioned, the top 12 were reversed. So that saw Franco Colapinto starting in the P1 position, position. With over 30 cars taking place in the Formula 3 2023 season, with 17 drivers making their first debut, it was definitely looking to see about an all-rookie podium. However, it was Joseph Maria Marti, aka Pepe Marti, who took the checkered flag in the Bahrain sprint race. There was two safety cars that took place within the seven first seven laps, so that definitely means that there was a lot of wheel-to-wheel action. Like always, first lap is always, there's something always going on. For the first lights out of the 2023 F3 season, Franco Colapinto, who was in pole position, defended his top spot as the lights went out, fending off Pepe Marti around the corner at turn one. Marti's attempts at taking the lead left him very vulnerable, and he slipped back to third at turn two, while Kyle Collette moved into second. However, due to the new rules instituted into Formula 2 and Formula 3, DRS actually opens after the first racing lap. This is going to allow a lot more closer battles, especially in the first couple of laps before a lead can be really established. Because of this as well, on lap two, safety car was deployed following a collision with Van Amersfoort racing Rafael Villagomez, finding himself in the wall after ba- ga- battling Gabriel Bartolotto. This was pitching the number 18 Van Amersfoort racing car into the wall. Thus, the safety car was deployed on lap two. Once it was green flag, Franco actually left it to the very, very last minute, weaving almost to the end of the start of the line. However, this actually turned out to be a great move for him because he was able to defend on the restart. So it was Colapinto who led away and defended his top spot well from lights out. He fended off Marty, who was trying to have a move around the outside at turn one. However, Marty's attempt at taking the lead left him vulnerable to the cars behind. As the pack wound through through turn three, uh, sorry, as the, as the pack wound through turn two, even I always get confused with the with the corner numbers in in, in circuits. Looking at you, turn two, Austria. Um, he unfortunately slipped back to third as Kyle Collett uh, went uh, went at the inside and moved up into second place. By the time we rolled rolled around to the second lap, when DRS is also enabled, as Sophia said, Colapinto had already created a half a second lead from Cairo Colo. It was, however, a bit short-lived, as, as in true S3 style, the safety car came right out following a, following a collision. Unfortunately, Rafael Villagomez found himself in the wall after battling with Bortoletto. This battle pitched the, the number 18 Van Amersfoort racing car into the wall and the safety car came out. Once everything was all cleared up and the drivers were, were okay and back in the garages, the safety car came back in and racing resumed. Colapinto led away at, at the safety car restart line and he, he, he did it right at the last second. He backed the pack up and then, and then he went all the way to the end of the safety car line before booting it. Quite a smart move given the slipstream you can get on that fairly long straight down into turn one. While Colapinto steer, uh, steered clear of trouble into turn one, Marty tried to put pressure on Collett through turn one. Once again, he found himself vulnerable, and this time it was the pre- it was the Premier Racing rookie of Paul Aaron who was behind him having a look. 
Marty eventually managed to get past Collett into turn four to leave himself in second place. Further down the pack, Luke Browning found himself out of the race on the restart after he was tapped from behind, which triggered the second safety car. Maybe that's where Lance Stroll got the idea from. Also, Collar Pinto retained the lead from, from Marty on the restart. But again, DRS is pretty powerful. And even though they moved the activation line further down, Marty was very, very quick to start putting pressure on, uh, on the Williams Jr. driver. He pushed him all the way out of turn three, up towards turn four. But then as the drivers came through turn four, it was it was too much to ask of, of Carlo Pinto. And Marty went around the outside and then began to sail away into the lead. Marty drove out of DRS range by the time the checker flag came out, securing first position in Bahrain. Carlo Pinto stayed second. Probably going to be a bit disappointed that, that he got caught with DRS, but such is the nature of a spec series. And, and Kyle Collett managed to come home third ahead of the rookie drivers of Paul Aaron and Biganovic. Goethe came home a pretty impressive six with Gregoire Sorsi securing seventh for ART and Leonardo Fornan Rawley making the top eight. I probably actually butchered that pronunciation. I'm really sorry. Um, I'll put it down to it being late. Um, Johnny Edgar and Sebastian Montoya fought, uh, had a very, very good battle to bring home the final points where they came home ninth and tenth, respectively. Now, let's have a quick look at the sprint race for F2 this weekend. So it was a maiden podium for the longest F2 driver in the season, who's been there from the start. Ralph Barshan has ended his seven-year streak of finishing off the top of the podium, winning the first F2 sprint race of the 2023 season in Bahrain. This was on his 96th race start. While he has had podiums throughout his racing career in Formula 2, he's never taken the top spot, so it was a great thing to see from that. He actually took it with 10.8 seconds ahead of second place Dennis Hauger, and the F2 rookie Victor Martins taking third, with his teammate Teo Porcher gaining five positions to finish fifth ahead of Amuro Wasa. But 10 seconds, absolutely crazy. There was a lot of battles between P2, P3, P4, like all the lower uh, positions, but Ralph, starting from pole because of the reverse grid, just absolutely ran with it, and didn't even need to worry about the DRS starting at lap two because he was well off the pace from all the other racers. It was definitely more of a battle between Dennis and Victor and Teo and uh, Iowasa as well. So let's see how it was with lights out. As mentioned, Ralph Barsha had started off in first and he kept his lead from the pole at lights out. Roman standing, starting with him on the front of the grid, actually slipped from second to fourth by the first corner, which allowed Dam's teammates who were starting P3 and P4, Arthur Lekirk, rookie for the 2023 F2 season, and Arasa fighting for second. Arasa came out of, on top of the battle, taking third for the time being. Victor Martens also took advantage of Roman Stanley's issues, issues, taking fourth at turn 11 in the first lap. A wide turn by Stanley in the final corner made matters worse, allowing Dennis Hauger as well to come through for P5. That's a lot of overtaking within the first couple corners. Teo Porcher was next in line to push Stanley down to the standings, pushing him out to sixth place. At turn one on lap three, the ART pair of Victor Martins and Theo Porcher slipped past the opponents. Victor Martins took third from Leclerc and Porcher was taking fifth before quickly making a move on Leclerc and sitting in fourth within the same lap. Unfortunately, things went bad to worse for Leclerc after a starting procedure infringement landed him with a 10-second stop-go penalty. As well, Isaac Alshar was handed the same penalty. Both of the drivers had to enter the pits on lap seven to serve them. It was because it was because of potentially staff were at the car too late once the final red light before they had to go into formation lap. They were still on the grid, which is a really big no in for safety more than anything else. And there was actually a lot of infringements, not just in F2, which you would be surprised, but even in F3, 
and both in the sprint and in feature races. Halfway through the sprint, Ralph Barsha was three seconds ahead um, on to lap 13. Martins, Victor Martins, underbraked into turn one, which allowed Awasa to secure the position by, ter- by the turn eight hairpin. Terry Crochet, who was lying in wait, used the battle for P2 to his advantage, dicing to the inside at turn 10 in an attempt to pass Awasa. Awasa had a better exit onto the straight, retaining the pos- position, leaving Porsche defending from Halger. Halger with DRS took fourth from Porsche and into turn one on lap 14. However, as well, while that battle was still taking place, Oasis left the door for Hagrid to take third on lap 15 with a lockup on the final corner. As well, Teo Poche used this lockup to his advantage and tried his luck at taking third before Oasa cut him out front once again. Towards the end, last lap, Ralph Barshad had a lonely race, finishing 10.8 seconds ahead of Halga, as mentioned before. Such a big lap gap between that. You you wouldn't expect that for a Formula 2 or Formula 3. You wouldn't even expect it in Formula 1, but obviously Max Verstappen had that on Sunday's races as well, quite a gap. Um, I, I guess they just didn't want to battle or anything. Uh, tire degradation was probably a key thing as well, which helped them with getting more of a distance and not having to worry about tires falling off the cliff and not having to worry about DRS battles because it seems that DRS is quite more powerful this season for F2 and F3 than previous seasons. Well, at least in my opinion. As mentioned, Victor Martins held on to third. Owasa stayed fourth. Pusher held off Druva to complete the top five with rookie Kushmani and another rookie, Enzo Filippaldi, clinching the final points, finishing seventh and eighth. Now let's look at the Sunday feature race where all the points are on the table. Let's take a look at how F3 was. And it was a Trident 1-2 with an all-rookie podium as well. It was heartbreak for pole sitter Gabriel Mini after dominating the first feature race when a time penalty and a late safety car pushed him down to finish from first to eighth. As mentioned, it was an all-rookie podium and an F1 driver experience. In Formula 3, Fernando Alonso has a few drivers under his management team, and for both the sprint and feature race, they were both part of who both drivers who took top position were part of his management. But there was no shortage of action on Sunday's feature race with safety cars, time penalties, great overtakes to start the 2023 season. So at Lights Out, we had Gabriel Mini and, and Gabriel Bortoletto starting on the front row, but it was indeed the, the Trident driver who got the better start when the lights went out. As the drivers approached turn one, he was able to overtake uh, Gabriel Mini, who fell even further behind and ended up uh, behind the ART of Greg Rossi, who was starting on the second row. Saucy is also one of the favourites of the season, as we spoke about in the F3 preview a couple of weeks back. Further down through, through the grid, we had Johnny Edgar, the MP Motorsport driver, who was coming back to F3 after um, after some time out due, due to some health issues. He managed to make up an impressive five places in the opening two laps to get his MP Motorsport into the points. Now, as we've already mentioned, DRS is obviously now activated after one racing lap as opposed to two racing laps. However, it didn't make as much of a difference today because Bortoletto was already two seconds ahead by the time he got into the DRS zone. And and obviously you have to hit the activation point on your second lap as well. Um, So by the time he went through the activation point, which is just before turn one on lap two, he was already two seconds ahead of Gabriel Mini behind him. If we just take a quick look back to his starting position, Gabriel Mini didn't give up and he showed real determination and guts as as he breaks super late and went round the outside of Greg Barsorsi through turn four to claim second place back. Campos were following through on a top podium in F2 and F3 sprint races, and sadly they had their first retirement. Um, Hugh Barter, who was who was closing in on Johnny Edgar, clipped his right rear, causing causing a puncture, and forced him to retire 
from his first feature race in S3, not the debut he would have wanted. I'm sure we can all I'm sure we can all agree. Shortly after, on lap seven, we saw the first safety car of the feature race deployed as there was contact at the hairpin between the Van Amersfoort Racing, Tommy Smith, and MP Motorsports, Marie Boyer. The Australian managed to get going again, but Boyer had to retire as there was too much damage to his car and he had to pull off track and DNF from the race. After the restart, Gabriel Mini wasted absolutely no time in making a move on Bortoletto to, to gain back P1, which he had started from. Shortly after his successful move around the outside of Bortoletto, his team informed him that he had a five-second time penalty. Unfortunately, this was for an incorrect position in his grid box at the start of the race. Now, if anybody saw the F1 on Sunday and has seen pretty much any FIA-sanctioned event, um, unfortunately, as Martin Brendel would say, that's a slam dunk penalty. You know, it, you know the um, uh, for, for those of you who, who aren't aware, when the drivers line up on their grid positions, if you look at the overhead charts or if you look at one of the TV angles, you can see there's a yellow line which sticks out quite far to the right here so the drivers can obviously see and line up their wheels. There are also sensors in the track, so that's how um, that's how the FIA knows that drivers are over their, you know, have overshot their grid spot or something. So it's not something which which can really be argued with. It's it's a very, very sort of small thing, but you know, it, it is in the rule book and it does say a five second time penalty. So that was uh, yeah, that was uh, that was gutting for him. But uh not not all hope was lost. Um and also uh, quite a few of the rookies this season had good races, including the last confirmed driver who was only just confirmed before free practice. And it was the high-tech Pulse 8 driver, Luke Browning. He started in P17 and he drove the absolute wheels off that high-tech to get up to P8. This is also following the previous day sprint winner, who was Joseph uh, Marty, aka Pepe, uh, who when who overtook Trident's Leonardo Fornaroli, whose tyres were failing pretty quickly by this point in the race. Bahrain is a fairly abrasive surface anyway, combined with high track temps, uh, tyres can absolutely fall off a cliff sometimes. Fornaroli's teammate, Oliver Gother, was able to climb up positions and managed to get himself onto the podium following an overtake around the outside of Grograss Horsey to claim that final podium spot of P3. Towards the end of the race, Gabriel Mini had a comfortable gap between himself and Bortoletto to really take home that P1, even though he had the time penalty. Sadly, on the penultimate lap, Tommy Smith went in far too deep with turn one on the brakes with a huge lockup, and he made contact with Roberto Faria of PHM Racing, a.k.a. Sharoos. This brought out the safety car. Now, I'm sure you all know where we're going with this. You know, Bortoletto, uh, sorry, not Bortoletto, um, Mini was leading the race. He was doing everything he needed to do to keep the five-second gap. Safety car comes out. What happens? The pack get, gets punched up. And sadly, he lost that five-second gap, which meant his podium chances went, uh, went, went away with, with, with that gap. Uh, he was still able to, to score some points. He ultimately finished P8, uh, not on the road, uh, he, but he, he finished P8 on, on paper after his time penalty had been, uh, had been applied. This, this promoted Gabriel Bortoleto to the top spot, uh, and Bortoleto also claimed a point as he scored uh, fastest lap in his first year in F3. Not bad going. Gotha's efforts throughout the race gave him seconds, and then the rookie driver, Beganovic, managed to join them on the podium, which rounded out the top three. So, all in all, quite the feature race. Now, let's take a quick look at the feature race for Formula 2. Well, it was no surprise. If you start on pole, most likely you will finish at the top spot, and that's exactly what it was for Teo Porche, holding a dominant fight into the final lap. He claimed his first feature race of the season, winning a comfortable 19 seconds off. 
from P2. Again, an absolute astonishing feat for that. Uh, like, didn't even know what was happening. He just, he was in this other world. He said that even in the press conference and the cool down room, he was looking down at the screens because he didn't know where everybody was, not knowing how much unfolded throughout the entire feature race. Ralph Barshad also scored his second podium of the weekend. It's been a good day for him, a good weekend for him and for Campos Racing. And Zane Maloney, stunning drive, starting from P8 on the grid, taking the final podium spot. And it was an overtake build feature race in Bahrain. On the first lap, the safety car was deployed. At turn four, push came to shove. Richard Vestor was actually tapped into the spin as the field bunched up for the right-hander turn. Roman Stanek, Victor Martens, and Frederick Vesti were all involved, and the trio were left out running as a result. For sure, was fortunate to get going again, but it was the last as the safety car was deployed. Oliver Behrman profited massively, avoiding the chaos and reaching fourth, having starting from P12 on the grid. Joining alongside him was Ralph Barsham. Looking at the replays, I don't know, I don't understand how there was not that many cars. Um, DNFing like obviously we had the three DNFs from that but it was good good reflexes good quick win and even the commentators um, were shocked to see Ralph Walsh on into P2 from that having starting quite far down the grid um, starting in P10. Racing resumed on lap four and Taylor Porsche moved clear once again ahead of Kushmani and Ralph Walsh and Ollie Behrman. The Campos Racing team, who are currently side P2 and P3, decided to split his strategy due to Ralph Barsha on the soft tires, and he was able to put a move on the hard tire driver, Kushmani, into turn one, taking second from his teammate. The first pit stops of the race were on lap 11, with Arthur Leclerc pitted from 10th, followed by Jack Dewan and Jehan Derubla just all behind them. These three switched from the hard car pound to the softs and rejoined 15th, 16th, and 17th following their early pit stops. Once most of the teams go for pit stops, then other teams are looking at um, pitting their drivers to help with the undercut, which is quite a common phrase we'll say throughout this Formula Talk season. It's a type of strategy. You have the undercut and overcut, which is used both in, you can hear it in F1 as well. And it's just a strategy to ensure that the driver does not get overtaken or undertaken, hence the <laughs> overcut and undercut. Um, each team decides what strategy is probably better. Throughout Bahrain and in the feature race, it was primarily the undercut that was talked about uh, quite a lot, and this is also due to the tire degradation, switching from hard to softs and softs to hard, depending on what the first strategy is. With Formula 2 as well, in the feature race, there is a mandatory pit stop that has to take place. Now, they can take multiple pit stops if need be, and we can mention that about Clement Novelak, who took three pit stops uh, compared to most of the other drivers only taking one or two. Because of this as well, most drivers started to pit shortly after lap 11. This allowed Ralph Walshon to actually have the lead up until lap 14, where he served his mandatory pit stop. At the halfway point of the feature race, Taylor Porcher was able to lead the pack by 12 seconds from P2 Ralph Walshon, Arthur Leclerc, Chris Manny, and Oli Behrman. However, Leclerc was under pressure from Manny on lap 19, and the dam driver went a little too deep under braking for turn 10, giving Kush Manny the momentum to get onto the DRS straight to take third. Ollie Behrman and Oasa was able to pile on the pain for the dam driver, relegating Leclerc from to six on lap 20. Carling teammates, rookie drivers, Enzo Fittipaldi and Zane Maloney were actually wheel-to-wheel on lap 22. The Barbadian driver took eighth into turn six, setting off the pursuit for a recovering Jack Dewan ahead, and it didn't take long for him to get by, surging from the outside and overtaking the virtuosi racing driver on turn four on lap 24. Following Zane's overtake of Jack Dewan, he was able to catch up to Arthur Leclerc and was able to force a lockup from Charles Leclerc, moving Zane Maloney up to six. Full of confidence, he was able to actually put a move on Owasa on turn 11 on lap 26 and looking comfortable on his softs as the grip levels began to fit, 
fall away from the others. He was able to t- take fourth from Bamin on lap 27. Now I'll mention as well, he started P18 on this grid. <laughs> like, this is a rookie as well. This is a rookie F2 driver. He was the runner-up um, for Formula 3 last season, and he was the top finishing rookie last season as well. So definitely a driver to look out for. I've mentioned on multiple podcasts um, that he probably will take podiums and would be a really good contender for the title this season. As mentioned, Teo Poche comfortably drove to the top position for the feature race, finishing over 19 seconds from Ralph Barsham, who's actually claimed back-to-back podiums in Secure, which is probably one of his best race weekends so far in his seven-year career. With Zay Maloney making so much from starting from P18, he was able to take the last position, um, on the podium, finishing third, and getting well-earned points for Trident. Rounding up the rest of the top 10, Richard Vischer was able to move past Leclerc on the final lap to secure P5, finishing along with taking the fastest lap, which is another point added to Richard Vischer's point score. Isaac Hajar was able to pass Owasa at turn 11 on the penulti- penultimate lap to take seventh, Enzo Fittipaldi and Juan Manuel Correa completed the top 10. So that's the Bahrain review. Now let's look forward to seeing what's the best of the 2023 F2 and F3 calendar season. Now we have a little bit of a break following, obviously following um, F1's calendar. However, F2 will be going to Saudi next. That should be quite interesting given it's so fast paced. Obviously having these drivers test in Bahrain previously and they've raced at this track so often. Most of them know it, but like the back of their hands, I think Jed will probably be the main first display, I should say of these driver skills and knowledge. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, the drivers are obviously pretty comfortable with Bahrain. It's, 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 it's got some challenging points, you know, many of that downhill braking zone in, in, into turn 10. But obviously, we saw Alonso put in a great move in the F1. But for the most part, you know, drivers are comfortable with it. They've obviously done it a lot in testing. So it shouldn't have been, I say, too much of a challenge. I mean, you know, when the adrenaline gets go in, anything could be a challenge. But Jed is a completely different kettle of fish. Um, I mean, you know, if you look at the two F1 races we've had there so far, just, just as a sort of example, I mean, you know, 2021, obviously there was the title fight going on, but um, it's a, it's a proper like old school type street circuit. And um, I think it was Ross Braun said that when they designed it, they wanted it to be your know, old school, fast, twisty, you know, right up against the walls, um, you know, no sort of like, you know, 90 degree turns, all the rest of it. And it's, um, yeah, it's a seriously, seriously quick track. I think, aside from, I'm sure I read that, aside from Monza, it's the second quickest track on the calendar um, because the cars, well, F1 cars can hit uh, 200 miles an hour uh, around around Jeddah. I mean, obviously, F2 cars are obviously not that fast, but still, you know, they are they are going to be flying. And, uh, you know, we, we saw, um, it was either last season or the season before we saw quite a nasty accident at the start with, I cannot remember who it was. I want to say Fittipaldi, but I may be wrong. Um, so Fitz nodding at me, so that's that's a good sign. He makes a change from a scowl. Um, so, uh, oh, there she goes. Um, but, yeah, no, it's, you know, the, hopefully we have an exciting but safe race and we don't want to see, you know, we don't want to see a big pile up or, or anything, you know, as, as much as sometimes, pe- you know, people might say, you know, or, you know, do you see that and all the rest of it? I don't want to see drivers injured. I want to see good racing, but and you know sometimes accidents do happen. You know, if, you know, if a driver misses a breaking point and locks their wheels, like we saw in the last lap in Bahrain, um, you know, it can happen. But I don't want to see drivers taking unnecessary risks, especially this early on in the season. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Tom mentioned fifth party. It was not Enzo who is currently racing in Formula 2. It's his older brother, Pietro Fittipaldi, who suffered the accident from that. Um, as well, Formula 3 will not be racing for that. I 100% agree with that decision. Having 30-plus cars on the grid on such a narrow, short, fast track, it, it probably would breed so many 
crashes and it just would put so much safety risks to the drivers. And as Tom mentioned, you don't want that at the beginning of the season because sometimes these recoveries are long and it makes all the difference in the standing. Some of these um, drivers taking time out for the injuries for it and taking the rest that they deserve and need for it. But we'll see. So that's F2's next race. However, F3, which obviously F2 will be racing at the same time. So we'll discuss it a little bit later. But back in Australia, for, not back, for the first time ever, F2 and F3 will be racing in Australia. That will be as well one, one of the great ones to watch because they've never raced there. There's only a handful of drivers who know this circuit having race in Australia. I'm looking at Tommy Smith in Formula 3 and a few other Australian drivers, Jack Dewan and all of them, like, who raced in that um, side of the region. So definitely ones to look out for. But next episode as well, we will be previewing the F2 Saudi races and also any new news as well for that. Formula 1 Academy has been dropping some of the drivers and we're so close to finishing the grid. I think there's only probably about four or five spots left of that. I know two teams have fully confirmed the three drivers so far. So once that grid is done, we'll definitely um, spend some time on Formula Talk to discuss who these drivers are, and especially leading up to the new season. So yeah, that is the Bahrain F2 and F3 review and great way to start off the season. Made in podiums, year-long career waiting podiums, looking at Ralph Balshaw, seven years 96 races, absolutely. It almost matches Fernando Alonso's record of not being on the podium for some time as well or taking pole. <laughs> but great opportunities, and it's it's shaping to be a great season, and these rookie drivers know how to drive, and they are not playing. It's, I'm so excited for this season. So Formula Talk is available on YouTube, where some of the episodes will be recorded live. We're still in process at the moment for doing this. However, you can find us on Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal, and Pocket Cast. Just search Formula One Grid Talk for our back catalog of shows with previous reactions to the qualifying and race results, as well as Formula Talk. Please consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can get better mics, lights, and better recording equipment. And also, make sure that you're subscribed so you're the first to know when each new weekly episode is released. We'll be back soon with plenty more Formula Talk Talk content. Thank you, Tom, for joining me for this episode. Pleasure as always. And thank you very much for listening. And that's goodbye from me. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.